Thank you, um, Professor Kihara Masahiro, um, and all of you for coming. It's, it's an honor for me to be at Kyoto University. Um, we've been trying to arrange this for a while, and I'm glad it finally worked. Um, and uh, thank you, Suman, for helping arrange this, and thank you to our colleagues for coming all the way from Uganda. Uh, TASO actually has been a very important organization in the fight against HIV AIDS, and actually in health more broadly. Um, and was actually one of the inspirations for the creation of the PEPFAR plan um, with some of the programs that they were running long time ago, long before antiretroviral therapy was available. So the topic of um, the presentation I'm honored to give uh, relates to HIV control with a special focus on young people, but not limited to, because we need to control HIV among everyone. Um, and to set it in context, as many of you know, we've transitioned from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. And there are two some components within that I think are important. First is a broader issue, which is a call for us to focus on individual people, um, not just an issue like HIV or TB or malaria or even health, but focus on human beings and what human beings need to develop and therefore what communities, countries in the world needs to develop. So a much different focus than the Millennium Development Goals. And actually this is very much related to human security, which is something uh, Japan, uh, the intellectual and academic community, but also the uh, development uh, organization, JICA, and the government of Japan have been advocating for a long time. And secondly, um, uh, to broaden out in health with a special focus and for the first time to have a goal on universal health coverage, uh, which is hugely important and again a topic Japan has been advocating for for a long time. So this transition has uh, actually been important in the global funds thinking as well as the, as the world's and I'll come back to that in a little bit. But it is important that we save lives and that we fight HIV and so in terms of investments the global fund makes, uh, we actually currently, programs supported by the Global Fund through the end of last year, uh, have saved 20 million lives. Uh, now those are programs like TASO and they're run by others. That's a unique thing about the Global Fund. We don't run the programs, we support people to do it. But programs, which is really remarkable, in just since 2004, have saved 20 million lives. And is actually on track to save 22 million lives by the end of, 20, of 2016, by the end of this year. Um, now those lives saved are not just through treatment, they're actually through prevention, through infections averted, um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. If you look at the investments the fund has made and countries that we support, you actually see pretty remarkable progress um, in uh, trends in deaths related uh, to program support in the Global Fund. So. Um, in terms of antiretroviral therapy and HIV. If you look at the blue line, so this is, this is the trajectory countries were on, uh, and this is what's happened in countries supported by the Global Fund. So a dramatic decline in deaths from HIV. And it correlates with significant increases in investment. So as money and investments have gone into the countries to support programs like TASO, it's had a dramatic decline on the death rate but also a dramatic decline in the projected infection rate. So this is the projected infection rate that was seen in the countries that the Global Fund supports. And this is what we've seen actually happen in countries, again, as investments have increased. And so we actually have always seen treatment and prevention as two sides of the same coin. But what's exciting now is how we get to the end of HIV, how we get to a controlled epidemic. And this is these are uh, data that uh, we actually did collectively with Peter Piot, a very good friend of the professors, uh, who's been here at Kyoto University, ran UNAIDS, um, and Tim Hallett from Imperial College. But if we, this is, this is where we are today, basically. And if we continue along the pathway we're on, this is what will happen. And the reason for that is we've run up into barriers. In fact, we're starting to see countries' prevention rates stagnate or even increase. And while we could invest well over the last 15 years and see tremendous impact, unless we change course, unless we change what we do, we will continue around this trajectory. But if we intervene much more intelligently, 
um, uh, with much better prevention approaches, either in a uniform way across a country, or even more importantly, I'll come back to this in a focused way, we can actually get down to functional control of the epidemic. That's with the tools we have today. What's exciting about that is if we can get to levels that are this low, a partially effective vaccine, 50, 60, 70 percent, would probably be sufficient to end the epidemic. Whereas if we're in this trajectory, we need a 95 percent effective uh, vaccine. And so the control of the epidemic, if we can get to that point, will not only save a lot of lives now, it would also allow us to push towards ending the epidemic entirely, uh, probably within the next 15 years, as the Millennium Development Goals call on us to do. Now, in order to help us achieve that, the Global Fund, which is a part of the picture, we're, we're not the only funder. In fact, PEPFAR funds more HIV programs than the Global Fund. And the countries, importantly, now finance 50% of their own response to HIV, but we all fit together to try to make a difference. Uh, and Japan has been extraordinarily generous to the Global Fund, which I'll come back to. But we've adopted a new strategy that relates to the Sustainable Development Goals. To maximize impact against the three diseases is the first pillar. The second is to build resilient and sustainable systems for health because we cannot at this point actually achieve the first objective, maximizing impact without strong health systems themselves. We could get the response we got over the last 15 years, just going in and supporting effectively in place as parallel structures. But without these systems, we can't actually get to control of the epidemic, the end of the epidemic. And that really means universal health coverage. To promote and protect human rights and gender equality, and I'll come back to that because it's a crucial pillar if we're going to achieve control of the HIV epidemic, and mobilize resources. That's both globally, but also in country. And beneath that, strategic enablers, including innovation and differentiation, so that we do things differently in different countries, depending on where they are. A country like the Central African Republic, our Democratic Republic of Congo, is in a very different position than Rwanda, and so we have to behave in different ways. Uh, but also, account, support mutually accountable partnerships, which is what the Global Fund was created to do, to partner with others to achieve extraordinary results. Now I want to, before getting into the control of the epidemic, I did want to talk a little bit about how we invest in resilient and sustainable systems for health to achieve universal health coverage, because again, it will be essential to control of the epidemic. And we invest in pretty much all of the key areas of, uh, of health systems. In fact, about 40% of all the investments that we make, which is pretty high, about 40% of all the investments we make go for health systems, including at TASA, where a lot of support goes for basic system strengthening. But now we're particularly focused on supply chain, procurement and supply chain, because these are huge issues, not only for HIV, TB, and malaria, but responding to Ebola or the next epidemic. If you don't have drugs and services in clinics, you can't respond to anything. And importantly, program quality, which is what our friends from TASA will talk about, because we can actually get much better impact for, the va for what we're investing today, which was that graph I showed you before, that if we focus and invest well, we can actually get better results. And these will all make significant contributions to universal health coverage. Now, I'm going to talk about the last pillar of our, our strategy first, and then go into the other pieces more in depth we just talked about resilient health systems. One is raise more money uh, because we need more resources if we're gonna end these epidemics. And Prime Minister Trudeau just hosted our, our fifth replenishment at which we raised almost 13 billion US dollars, which is extraordinary in this environment. Many countries increased their contributions. Japan really performed way above what we expected, um, contributing 800 million US dollars. Uh, that's important because with the yen having decreased, that's about a 45% increase in what was provided over the last replenishment because the commitment is made in dollars. And many countries also increased. Canada increased 20%, um, the European Union 30%, um, the United Kingdom 37%. So you see the strong commitment of financial resource increase led by Prime Minister Trudeau. Now the important thing about that is with those resources, we believe we can support countries to save 8 million lives over the next th three years, which is pretty extraordinary. 
prevent 30 million, 300 million new infections, many of which are HIV, increase domestic spending of 41 billion because by us investing we actually have co-financing requirements, and importantly, having a massive economic impact because these diseases cause huge disruption to the economies of many countries. Uh, and we estimate about $290 billion will actually be saved in economic loss as we save 8 million lives and prevent 300 million new infections. So extraordinarily and ambitious goals to get us towards achieving the Millennium Devel Sustainable Development Goal of controlling the epidemic. Uh, my slides got messed up a little bit there, but I wanted to reshow the slide I showed at the beginning, which is how do you control the epidemic? How do we go from that upper line of investing the way we're investing today, which is no significant impact from where we are today, to complete control? And what's the difference between those lines? And who lives in between those lines? Who's getting left behind? Because the difference actually is not to keep doing things the way we've been doing them, keep doing them in a global scale in a sense, but actually looking at micro epidemics. And this I think is, these are hugely important data as we're getting to understand the epidemics and the epidemiology. These data are basically heat maps, which um, comes from Tanser et al. and were presented at Croy in 2011. But we've actually seen this replicated, and I'll show you it in many places. Red is where there's high level of infection, greater than 4%. Uh, and blue is basically no infection at all. And what you see in just a small district, that even within a small district in, in South Africa, you see this huge variation in infection. So investing the same amount of money here or investing the same resources here as here doesn't make a whole lot of sense, nor will it have the same impact on the epidemic. And if you look even closer, you see that even within the red and yellow, you see these huge spikes in red in very small areas. And so it gets back to the basics of how do I find new infections, who's, who's at risk of infection, and how do we control? And as we look in other countries, we see similar data. So these are from Kenya. These are actually data that, again, Peter Piot and uh, Imperial College and we put together and have since published. So this is Kenya now. This is the entire country of Kenya. And as you can see, most of Kenya actually has fairly low infection rates. It's only in a few places that we see huge rates, large rates of infection. And if you take Kenya and basically map out the infection rate across Kenya, it's all coming from here. So, you know, all of the rest of Kenya, you know, this small little blue march, if you put the infections across the country, they basically are all coming from here, or the vast majority of the infections are coming from here. So again, would you invest in the same way in these areas that are blue, as you would here. And who are in these little red areas? Who are in the red areas that are driving the infections? If you did the same, you would find very similar results in Uganda. India, to move out of Africa, looks the same. So you have very high rates of infection in, for example, Karnataka. Uh, but, you have, and, and, but most of the country is in very light green. You just have these areas of very high levels of infection. And what's important about that, and I'm going to talk about India and leave the rest to Uganda, is what we invest in can actually make a difference. So they just looked in different parts of, 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 uh, of India and found out that if they invested in different ways, so if they focused on the general population, did the same thing everywhere, where, light, where it's light green and dark green, or you focused where there were sex workers or a high percent of HIV positive people, if you just looked at HIV testing, you save almost 20 fold and have almost 20 fold the results by focusing your investments. And I think we'll hear more about that from our folks from Uganda. I just wanted to point out that the same type of approach, the same thinking occurs everywhere. So who are the people that are in those bright zones? Well, it comes back to the human rights component and the human rights part of our strategy, because who lives in those zones are generally those who are left behind by society, the marginalized. And if you look across the world, if you look at the rates of sex workers, uh, in sex workers uh, in the general population versus 
the, uh, the uh, uh, sex work population, you see the difference of 27% to 70%, 65% to 13%, 9% to 1%. Huge, three to 10 fold differences. If you look at men who have sex with men, you go up, you have rates of 38% versus 2%, 37% versus 5%. So you see again these seven, 10, huge fold increases in the rates among men who have sex with men compared to the general population. And in people who inject drugs, if you go particularly in Eastern Europe, you see differences of 52 fold, so 50 times percent the infection rate in some countries. So these are the people in the bright red spots. But when you look in Africa, and, the, and if you map this out, and this is great work UNAIDS has done to show what's driving infections. So the colored bubbles are actually populations. So here in Eastern Europe, the vast majority of new infections are from people who inject drugs. If you look in Asia, the vast majority are people who inject drugs and uh, men who have sex with men. If you look in the Americas, the vast majority is men who have sex with men. So the, the size of the bubble relates to the population at risk. But if you look in sub-Saharan Africa, this massive dark blue, you don't see very many other places. That's adolescent girls and young women. And it's adolescent girls and young women that are driving the infection, which gets us to the topic of this talk, which is young women, or young people. And I wanna focus particularly on girls and women because they're the most at risk. And if you look at different parts around the world, we actually see the rate of infection in young women versus young men two to three fold uh, the rate. So women and girls in general are two to three times more likely to be infected. But if you look in Africa, the rates can actually be five, six, seven, eight times. In fact, if you look county to county in Kuala Zulu Natal, the rate can be 10 times higher in adolescent girls and young women as it is among young uh, men and boys. And the reason, and that's really worrying <laughs> when we start to look at the population going forward. Because if you look at the population rates from South, uh, Southern Africa, what you see is a very odd splay of population. And I think you all know this, that in Sub-Saharan Africa in 1950, you had kind of a normal population distribution. You had young people, but you had a lot of middle-aged people, and then the population would get older. But if you look to where we'll be in 2050, look at how many people are young. Look at the population below 30. Look at the population below 40. 60 to 70% of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa are going to be young people by 2050. We're gonna see a 40 to 50% increase in young people, which means we'll see a 40 to 50% increase in the number of young people at risk, which means the risk pool is huge because of that bubble I just showed you. And if we don't get control of the epidemic now among young people, we will lose control of the epidemic globally. Just by comparison, look at Japan. You're going in the opposite direction. So in 1950, you had that normal distribution. By 2050, you'll look at the opposite. You'll look up, upside down from Africa. You'll have a very old population, not a lot of young people. But you don't have a lot of HIV in young people, so that's OK. <laughs> your risk pool is actually going down. Uh, you have risks of other things, but your HIV risk pool is going down, whereas Africa is in the exact opposite position. So just comparing those two shows you how dramatic the risk is right now. And these are data from the Karims, Qureshi and uh, Slim in South Africa that shows us using phylogenetic tracing, you can actually trace the DNA of a virus and it has a unique marker. So you can, by, by taking a cohort of people, you can actually see who's infecting whom by looking at the DNA of the virus. And by doing that in couples, by having co a cohort of couples, what they showed is the pattern of infection that's causing this high rate of infection among young girls versus young men. And what we're seeing is that 25 to 40 year old men are preying on young women, 15 to 25. Can actually be younger than 15, but the data, is gen the data we have are 15 to 25. And that's why you see the rate so much higher in young women and men uh, are young women than in young men, because 62% of male partners are 25 to 40 year olds. They're much older than the women who are getting infected. But what happens then is these younger women grow older 
and they partner with the older men. And then so you have this cycle of infection of older men infecting younger women who then get older, who then balance out. And so by the time you get to 20, 40 years old, you have an equal rate of HIV infection between women and men. But among young people, you have this much higher rate, again, up to 10 times as many infections in young women as in young men. And why is that happening? Well, it's happening not for a medical reason. We've actually looked very hard for a medical reason. We've looked for, for is the subtype different? Is the, there a difference in the vaginal cavity that causes the infection rate? There is no medical difference that we found. What we found is a social disease, a social disease of inequality and gender-based violence. So somewhere in here, uh, there we go, um, in, in the hardest hit countries, 80% of all new infections are among adolescents and the vast majority of girls for the reasons we just talked about. The inequalities of practices are, 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 are huge, and I thought the data were on here, but they're not. But up to 58% of girls can have their first sexual experience through violence, abuse and violence. It's fundamental inequality that leads to the rates that we're seeing among women and men. And that's pretty extraordinary. 58% of first cases is abuse from those older men to those younger women. Younger women in, African, in some African countries, in fact in Asia and other places, aren't even registered when they're born because girls don't matter that much. They don't matter enough to even register them. And so this difference between girls and women, and those of you from Japan will know that 75, 100, 150 years ago, you had a similar situation, so did the United States. Uh, many of us just had voting rights for women in the last 40, 50, 60 years. And so this is not a criticism of their cultures. We've all gone through these cultural issues. And we all still have a long way to go in gender equality. But the gender inequality is so pronounced in these places that it's driving the HIV epidemic. Oh, this has the data on gender-based violence. Um, I want, I'll come back to that. So how do we respond? How can we actually make a difference in this when you're talking about a cultural disease, not a medical issue any longer? That requires us to do what the sustainable development goals call us to do, which is focus on a person, not a disease, because if we keep just responding in a medical way, we can't respond, we can't control the epidemic. And so if we look at some of the fascinating data that are coming out of Africa, we see one of the most effective ways to keep a girl protected is to keep her in school through secondary school, not just primary school. And so in a trial that was done in Malawi, um, which actually was about, not about HIV, it was about social protection, they gave cash transfers to keep girls in school. And what happened by keeping the girl in secondary school is a 60% reduction in HIV prevalence. 60%. Imagine if we had a vaccine that was 60% effective. Male circumcision is about the same rate. It's hugely impactful. 76% lower rate of HSV2, indicating that there was a much less rate of, eight, of sexual interaction at all because you saw both HSV and HIV going down. You saw less likelihood of, of, um, of sexual activity, fewer partners. 40% less likely to have early marriage. And we know early marriage is related to HIV for a variety of reasons that we can go into if you'd like. 30% lower rate of teenage pregnancy. 35% lower rate of dropping out of school. So it was keeping the girls in school that actually led to those dramatic decreases in HIV rates. In Lesotho, they use a, lot, a different approach. They use lottery tickets, but it was effectively a cash transfer to keep girls in school. And they saw a 25% lower HIV incidence, 33% lower among girls. Uh, so you can see a much greater difference between girls and boys because the girls are so much more at risk. I don't have the slide here, but Botswana did a study that showed for each year, each year, a girl stays in secondary school. There's a 12% decline in HIV. Each year, the boys were 8%. So again, showing that huge disparity between girls and boys, and how by keeping girls in school, we can actually make a huge difference. And so because of that, we're actually investing for the first time in keeping girls in school as a health organization. Uh, we just put $70 million, PEPFAR has $70 million, into South Africa, where the rates are the highest, uh, to have a comprehensive package to address issues related to girls. 
almost none of that is actually for traditional treatment care and the stuff we normally would have done 10 years ago. It's to keep girls in school. It's to provide social protection. It's to implement programs related to gender-based violence in a cultural, culturally sensitive way. And we'll be following that to see if we can see a decline in prevention uh, or in HIV rates. We're doing the same in Swaziland. We're now linking up with the Global Partnership for Education. Imagine that, a health organization linked to the Global Partnership for Education, to Girls Without Brides, to see if we can introduce programs together and to see if we can support countries to have one plan to address girls and women and gender inequality across departments of ministries of education, health, social development, gender, uh, where they exist, sport, to have a comprehensive approach and we'll each fund the appropriate piece. Those who fund education will fund education. Those who do social development will do social development. But to have one coordinated comprehensive approach to see if we can deal with the cultural issues that are driving the infection rates. We're also doing the health pieces of it because you have to link health for women as well. Uh, in Ethiopia, for example, the work that we do really all relates to overall investments in, in women's health, including prenatal care, which is about HIV and prevention of mother-to-child transmission, but they have so little transmission that the investments really are just in antenatal care. To decrease pregnancy rates, we actually invest in reproductive and, so and sexual health, but we also support 38,000 women extension workers, which is part of the resilient system, and it's those women being able to talk to other women that are leading to changes in gender norms and gender empowerment. So how do we end the AIDS epidemic? How do we control the epidemic, not just among young people, but in general? And this is where I want to conclude. And I think this is hugely important, and it gets back to what we've learned from health. We actually have to change the way we think, and then we have to change the way we act. So we've only eradicated one infection in history, smallpox. Some of you know that because you study it. One, it's kind of remarkable. We've only in, eradicated one infe infectious disease in, in all of human history, smallpox. We're on track to do it for polio, but we're hitting some bumps along the road. We actually did it for rinderpest, which is a zoonotic, zoonotic disease. And for any of you who have interest in this, I strongly encourage you to re read Bill Faggy's House on Fire. It's a tremendous book. It's 100 pages about how we eradicated smallpox. And one of the points he made, and one of the points that we know from polio now, and also from rinderpest, is we actually have to change our starting point on how we think about the infection. We actually have to begin by thinking about how do we end an epidemic. So we begin with what does it get, how do we invest to end an epidemic, and then we backtrack to what interventions do we talk about. The way we've thought about most diseases, including HIV, for the last 15 years and still do is we talk about what intervention do we like. Do I like test and treat? Do I like male circumcision? Do I like programs on antenatal care? And if we do, and these are all hugely important, or do I like programs on condoms, or keeping girls in school, or addressing discrimination? All very important programs, but if our focus is how do I scale up this individual project, we won't get to control, we'll get to scale up of individual projects. Whereas we think about if our starting point is how do we get to control, how do we understand the drivers of the epidemic in those heat maps I showed you, who's getting infected and why, what's the package of interventions that will have the greatest impact, monitor that and then adjust in real time, then we'll pick the interventions, and these will all get scaled up, but we'll be doing it to end an epidemic, not to scale up an intervention. And that's something we learned actually with smallpox, and it's something we have to do. And we have to monitor in real time and adjust because you might pick the wrong package of services, but you first need to know the epidemiology, you need to know the drivers of the infection, you need to know where the new infections are, and you then need to go in and focus on ending the epidemic and monitor it. And because of what we just talked about, because in Sub-Saharan Africa, HIV, we will win or lose the battle in Sub-Saharan Africa based on whether or not we win or lose the demographic dividend, which is an increased young group of young people, or lose it because they'll get infected from HIV at a higher rate. It'll all depend on youth, which means engaging youth. And if you read Bill Faggy's book on smallpox, he'll tell you the reason we added that smallpox was the vaccine, but it was because we engaged community by community, 
the people who were involved, the people who were at risk, the people who were infected. And by involving them, we figured out how to put these packages together. And that means we can't end the HIV epidemic unless we involve youth and young people in the response because as we showed you in the communities, in those bright spots, in those red spots, it's young people who are at risk. So we actually have two interlinked historic opportunities. To end HIV as an epidemic and ultimately to end HIV, to control it, but also to create an inclusive human family because as we've talked about, what's driving the epidemic, those red spots, are actually things related to human rights things related to gender inequality, things related to how we treat each other as humans. It's no longer a medical question. We can actually, we have the tools, if we put them in the right place where the new infections are, we can control this epidemic and ultimately end it with a vaccine. The only question for us today is will we do it? And that's why we have a campaign and I think all of you should join called AIDS, AIDS, TB, and Malaria, End It for Good. It was the theme of our replenishment. There's actually a great video that you can go see and learn all about it on our website. And you can actually join it through hashtag End It for Good. Because it's this generation, you are the generation of the, of the healthcare providers. You are the generation of the healthcare professionals that will help end this epidemic. And we can, we must, we will, but only if we all engage. Thank you.